Seventhly, before his voyage, he should make his peace with God, satisfy his creditors if he be in debt, pray earnestly to God to prosper him in his voyage, and to keep him from danger, and, if he be swayed jurist he should make his last will, and wisely order all his affairs, since many that go far abroad, return not home. This good and Christian counsel is given by Martinus Sayelarus in his epidemical canons before his itinerary of Spain and Portugal. Early in the morning Squire Hawkins took passage in a small steamboat, with his family and his two slaves, and presently the bell rang, the stage plank was hauled in, and the vessel proceeded up the river. The children and the slaves were not much more at ease after finding out that this monster was a creature of human contrivance than they were the night before when they thought it the Lord of heaven and earth. They started, in fright, every time the gagecocks sent out an angry hiss, and they quaked from head to foot when the mud valves thundered. The shivering of the boat under the beating of the wheels was sheer misery to them. But of course familiarity with these things soon took away their terrors, and then the voyage at once became a glorious adventure, a royal progress through the very heart and home of romance, a realization of their rosiest wonder dreams. They sat by the hour in the shade of the pilot house on the hurricane deck and looked out over the curving expanses of the river sparkling in the sunlight. Sometimes the boat fought the midstream current, with a verdant world on either hand, and remote from both, sometimes she closed in under a point, where the dead water and the helping eddies were, and shaved the banks so closely that the decks were swept by the jungle of overhanging willows and littered with a spoil of leaves, departing from these points she regularly crossed the river every five miles, avoiding the bite of the great binds and thus escaping the strong current, sometimes. She went out and skirted a high bluff sandbar in the middle of the stream, and occasionally followed it up a little too far and touched upon the shoal water at its head, and then the intelligent craft refused to run herself aground, but smelt the bar, and straightway the foamy street that streamed away from her bows vanished, a great foamless wave rolled forward and passed her underway, and in this instant she leaned far over on her side, shied from the bar and fled square away from the danger like a frightened thing, and the pilot was lucky if he managed to straighten her up before she drove her nose into the opposite bank, sometimes she approached a solid wall of tall trees as if she meant to break through it, but all of a sudden a little crack would open just enough to admit her, and away she would go plowing through the chute with just barely room enough between the island on one side and the mainland on the other. In this sluggish water she seemed to go like a racehorse, now and then small log cabins appeared in little clearings, with the never-failing frozy women and girls in soiled and faded linsey woolsey leaning in the doors or against wood piles and rail fences, gazing sleepily at the passing show, sometimes she found shoal water, going out at the head of those chutes or crossing the river, and then a deckhand stood on the bow and hove the lead, while the boat slowed down and moved cautiously. Sometimes she stopped a moment at a landing and took on some freight or a passenger while a crowd of slouchy white men and negroes stood on the bank and looked sleepily on with their hands in their pantaloons' pockets, of course, for they never took them out except to stretch, and when they did this they squirmed about and reached their fists up into the air and lifted themselves on tiptoe in an ecstasy of enjoyment. When the sun went down it turned all the broad river to a national banner laid in gleaming bars of gold and purple and crimson, and in time these glories faded out in the twilight and left the fairy archipelagos reflecting their fringing foliage in the steely mirror of the stream. At night the boat forged on through the deep solitudes of the river, hardly ever discovering a light to testify to a human presence, mile after mile and league after league the vast bends were guarded by unbroken walls of forest that had never been disturbed by the voice or the footfall of man or felt the edge of his sacrilegious axe. An hour after supper the moon came up, and Clay and Washington ascended to the hurricane deck to revel again in their new realm of enchantment. They ran races up and down the deck, climbed about the bell, made friends with the passenger dogs chained under the lifeboat, tried to make friends with a passenger bear fastened to the verge staff but were not encouraged. P043.jpg, 25k Skinned the cat on the hog chains, in a word, exhausted the amusement possibilities of the deck. Then they looked wistfully up at the pilot house, and finally, little by little, Clay ventured up there, followed diffidently by Washington. The pilot turned presently to get his stern marks, saw the lads and invited them in. Now their happiness was complete. This cozy little house, 
built entirely of glass and commanding a marvelous prospect in every direction was a magician's throne to them and their enjoyment of the place was simply boundless. They sat them down on a high bench and looked miles ahead and saw the wooded capes fold back and reveal the bends beyond, and they looked miles to the rear and saw the silvery highway diminish its breadth by degrees and close itself together in the distance. Presently the pilot said, I George, Yonder comes the amaranth. A spark appeared, close to the water, several miles down the river. The pilot took his glass and looked at it steadily for a moment, and said, chiefly to himself, It can't be the blue wing. She couldn't pick us up this way. It's the amaranth, sure. He bent over his speaking tube and said, Who's on watch down there? A hollow, unhuman voice rumbled up through the tube in answer. I am. Second engineer. Good. You want to stir your stumps, now, Harry, the amaranth's just turned the point, and she's just up humping herself, too. The pilot took hold of a rope that stretched out forward, jerked it twice, and two mellow strokes of the big bell responded. A voice out on the deck shouted. Stand by, down there, with that lab board lead. No, I don't want the lead, said the pilot, I want you. Roust out the old man, tell him the amaranth's coming. And go and call Jim, tell him. Aye, aye, sir. The old man was the captain, he is always called so, on steamboats and ships, Jim was the other pilot. Within two minutes both of these men were flying up the pilot house stairway, three steps at a jump. Jim was in his shirt sleeves, with his coat and vest on his arm. He said, I was just turning in. Where's the glass? He took it and looked. Don't appear to be any nighthawk on the jackstaff, it's the amaranth, dead sure. The captain took a good long look, and only said, Damnation! George Davis, the pilot on watch, shouted to the night watchman on deck, How she loaded! Two inches by the head, sir! T ain't enough. The captain shouted, Now. Call the mate. Tell him to call all hands and get a lot of that sugar forward, put her ten inches by the head. Lively, now. Aye, aye, sir. A riot of shouting and trampling floated up from below, presently and the uneasy steering of the boat soon showed that she was getting down by the head. The three men in the pilot house began to talk in short, sharp sentences, low and earnestly. As their excitement rose, their voices went down. As fast as one of them put down the spyglass another took it up, but always with a studied air of calmness. Each time the verdict was, She's a-gaining, 